Amen. Almighty Bulwark is our God. So, brothers and sisters, I have the privilege this week of looking into God's Word as we're continuing in our sermon series talking about what makes a great church. We're close to closing this sermon series, but this is another message in that series talking about righteousness. What it is, where it comes from, what it means to the believer. So to get us going in those thoughts, I'll be reading to you this morning Psalm 11, as well as Romans chapter 4, verse 18, through chapter 5, verse 12. And I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous. But the wicked, those who love violence, He hates with a passion. On the wicked He will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words that were, it was credited to him were not written for him alone but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, He was delivered over to death for our sins, and He was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. You may be seated. So Father in Heaven, we stand in awe, Lord, that You have reconciled sinners to Yourself to save us from the coming wrath, Lord, Your great day of judgment. Lord, what a mercy that You've given us by grace. Lord, You fulfilled all the truth of Your Word. Lord, You gave us the great and glorious Gospel, the good news for sinners. Lord, that there can be peace with You. Lord, You sent Your Son, born of a virgin, Lord, to live a sinless life that we were commanded to live. And Lord, He did it. Lord, You went to that cross willingly for sinners like us. And Lord, You took the punishment that we deserve upon that tree. Lord, You were dead in that grave three days. And Lord, You were raised on that third day, giving many convincing proofs to thousands of people. Lord, 50 days later, You ascended to the Father and are awaiting that great and glorious day when You come back to make everything right. So Father, we present ourselves before You this morning desirous, Lord, to follow Your will, to know Your way in a greater way. Lord, that righteousness, this great gift that You've given us would be about us. So Lord, teach us this morning in a greater way. Give us a deep understanding of what this means in our lives. Lord, may we rejoice in You and the great hope that we have. And Lord, I pray that You would speak to Your servant. We praise You in Jesus' name. So brothers and sisters, this is a daunting task I have this morning. Righteousness is such a grand picture of what we are called to in the Word. And to try to begin to shape this message, I begin to look at this, and it's a peculiar task that God has laid upon men. When we stand before you, we are decorated dust, sinners, we yet our call to open this word and to explain what it means. The word righteousness is used 540 times in the Bible. So there's no way we will get to the bottom of the matter this morning. However, I do want to bring to our minds through this text a lot of what this picture is talking about. And if you've read through the book of Romans, and I know many, many of you have, there's this, this thread that goes through the book of Romans, and it is about God's righteousness and the call to righteousness. We are Gentiles that have been saved by faith through hearing the gospel good news. And in that truth, Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, gives us a really important picture that he uses a, as bookends on this book that I want to remind us of. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, it says this, Through him we've received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles, that will be you and me, to the obedience that comes from faith. And as this world despises the word of God and so many, unfortunately, too many churches don't understand that this call to obedience that comes from faith. Paul also 
closes this book in chapter 16, verse 26, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for a long ages past but now revealed and made known in the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever and ever. Amen. We don't hear enough what, about what this picture is in the obedience that comes from faith. And righteousness is a portion of that obedience that comes from faith. So, what and where and why, what is this picture about? So, we have to start with the good news. We have to start with the gospel. That's the diamond. That's the gem of our lives. And as we read the word, God will polish a new facet on that diamond to show His glory and he does that in the backdrop of a dark, sinful, broken world. And when the glory of his light shines on that diamond, that brilliance to the, to the one who received the Spirit of God is dazzling. It's amazing. So we need to grasp and hold on to the truth of the gospel. Because righteousness is the life and practice that comes from it's a flowing out of this gospel news. It's a flowing out of the principle of being born again. When you heard the gospel of your salvation, the good news that there is hope for sinners because God will come back. When Jesus ascended to the Father, He is awaiting that great and glorious day when the Father sends Him back. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, He is not coming back as the Lamb. Oh, when He was here, He was that gentle, kind, merciful, all glory to God, all fruit of the Spirit on display, all powerful, under control God-man that walked this earth. But when the Father sends Him back, He will be a ferocious lion that is going to devour all of his enemies. The wicked. The ones who have not been born of God. And when you read the Bible, there, you don't read people in between. Particularly a great way to understand righteousness. We won't get into this too much today. But when you read the Proverbs, you're going to see the righteous and the wicked continually, continually, continually compared against each other. And what you're seeing is there's no between. No difference. Jesus would say they're either for us or they're against us. This is the root of what the Bible teaches. Now, we as followers of Christ are not God. We do not know whom God will save, nor do we know who is saved. So by the Spirit of God that He's given us by the power of His Spirit, we go in love and mercy to all people, not knowing whom God shall save. So this righteousness has to supersede your perspective, your understanding of life, as we so often want to play God. This person, this group, can, they can't, they're not close, listen to them. No, 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 no. We never get to do that. We continue we offer the gospel. We offer the fruit from our lips. We offer mercy, gentleness, and kindness. There's no one we are to offer that to. For when we were yet sinners, God was merciful to us. Imagine if the one who brought the gospel to us had decided, this guy with the beard, he's, he's not worthy. I, I'm going to keep my lips shut. And I never heard the gospel of my salvation. Because in this day and age, the gospel is hidden. Very rarely, in very few places, will you hear this gospel, this glorious good news. So through the gospel, that the Lord Jesus came 
to this earth. He died on a cross. He was killed for the sins of His elect, of all the people that will believe. And only God knows that. Only God is aware. And He'll be merciful to whom He will be merciful, Romans 9. That's God's will, His way, and His plan. But for us, we need to understand that gospel makes us a new person, alive to the spiritual truths of God as revealed in His Word. And that effect of God sending His Spirit when we've repented of our sin, seen that we need a Savior, when we were with hope and without hope and without God in the world, the good news of the Gospel affected our conscience. We became aware that we were under the condemnation of God. We then knew the guilt and shame of our own sin. And we repented. We turned away from that sin. We turned away and we, from ourselves and we turned to God. That is the new life that God offers anyone who will hear the good news and repent. But unfortunately, we live in a day and age where as so many even Eastern philosophies or Eastern religions, I have friends that are Japanese and I've been had many great conversations with them and culturally it's easy to add Jesus to many of the gods that they already have. Hindus also. It's easy to have Hundreds. So to add Jesus to one of their gods is, is easy. However, Yahweh, the Lord Jesus, God Almighty, the triune God, does not share His glory with another. He only, He is the only God, and He is exclusive. He does not accept the worship of Him and others. He demands that His people who hear His voice turn away from all idolatry. Some people worship their idols culturally. They were raised in a particular fashion, religion. However, in America we have our own idols. They could be sports. They could be anything. They could be a work of anything. We are, we are plagued with idolatry and all different things. And idolatry is anything that's, that's supplanting your hope other than Jesus Christ. Your performance, your work, your, your any, anything. Anything that's taken up your time that you have your faith and trust in. And that might sound like I don't have my faith in those things. Though I encourage you to examine your life in the light of that to see if it's not true. And I'm convinced that it's true in everyone's life. For we're all guilty before a holy God. We all have we all have put things before the holy God Himself. So He calls us to turn away from that. So when salvation comes, the picture that God is calling us to is the whole man. All He wants all of our heart. He wants all of our soul. He wants all of the being that we are. Because this, this picture of being born from heaven, being born from above, does not accept God's will and way, and then I get to kind of fit mine in. Because that would be called self-righteousness. And God demands and commands that we lay down our self-righteous ways. And they're about us. They are all around the way we do things and the way we think. And the reason for that is in the absence of the truth of God, just with pragmatic philosophy, we will design a system that works for us. In the absence of truth of how we ought to deal with our neighbor, we will decide what we think is righteous. But God is calling us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I encourage you to examine your heart to see if you've done that. And I suggest you haven't. 
You've got to consider how much you love yourself. You, you take care of yourself. You, you wouldn't let yourself go and want. You wouldn't, but yet, there's so much need around us culturally. So we don't do that. So we need to look at that as a comparative and say, well, I need the righteousness of God because God is calling me to that. He's, he's driven this picture into our lives. And look, the Bible's clear. In Romans chapter 1, when we, when we start to close that chapter, he says these peculiar things. First of all, he says in, in chapter 1, verse 17, for in the gospel, which is just articulated to you, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. It is a righteousness that is by faith. You add nothing to your need of being saved but your sin. And that's another issue. It's another malady of the heart. You know, I babysat the neighbor's kid. Somehow I gained a righteous status before God. Absolutely not. You add nothing at all to your salvation. This way, the ground at the foot of the cross is level for all people. Because if I could outwork you, I would. I'd get up earlier. I'd stay later. That's, my, that's how I'm built. I would, I would try to do that. But God disallows that. His gospel is free. His gospel is merciful. And, is, and it, is, it doesn't matter who you are. You stand here. You say, it doesn't matter. For all have need of this grace of God and we're all equals in the eyes of God in this matter. But we sang that hymn by Martin Luther and this is the verse that saved his soul by reading the Bible. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last from beginning to end of our lives. Just as it is written the righteous will live by faith. Be very clear. Be very clear. We're going to come back to this thought. The righteous will live by faith. Let's make some terms very clear. You, when you repented, when you turned to God, He declared you righteous. The just judge of the universe banged the gavel. Case dismissed. You are declared righteous in His sight. Too much teaching talks about how we are still lowly slaves, how we're still broken. Nothing wrong. That's true. Yet we sin. That's the holy war of Romans 7. No doubt about it. But Romans 5 comes first. We must absolutely latch on to the thought that we have been declared righteous. What does that mean? That means if you and I, or any one of us, were to drop dead today, we could be absolutely confident that we stood before the Father. He'd say, come, my child, stand at my right hand. Look what I made for you. Look at this abode I have prepared in heaven for you. All goodness will set before you. Just wait a little longer to all your brothers and sisters are called in. Then I send my son back and we will live in glory forever. That's God's call. That's His command. That's the picture He has set before us. So we must understand that because of that great glorious good news, He says, now go. Go and believe my gospel, preach my gospel, and share my gospel. And if we don't latch on to the picture of righteousness, how could we do that? If we're, if we're grumbling around, if we're, if we're just completely guilt-ridden, shame-ridden because of our sin, no, lift your head up. Walk boldly in this life in the righteous commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this righteousness is a guide of how we ought to live because of the spirit that God has given us. He now takes 
his law that we were enemies with and then makes it glorious to us. As Paul would say in Romans 7, 21, for my, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. We'll just start with the Ten Commandments. We are not to murder, we're not to adulter, we're not to lie, we're not to covet. Why? Because to do that is evil. If I were to do that to, do, to you in any way, shape, or form, it would be sinful. Your heart would hate it. But when I'm in obedience to the commands of God, living righteously with direction by the command of God, by the power of His Spirit, not to lie, not to cheat, our love relationship begins to blossom, begins to grow. Trust and understanding become more entwined in our lives. And, and we have the privilege of beginning to admonish each other. And that's God's plan for His church. Now, our homes are little churches, it's true, where the commands and glories, good news of God and prayer and encouragement with each other to do what is right begin, but then we're all from different places. We all have different experiences of life, and the church calls us together to begin to love and learn and walk and encourage and strengthen each other. That's God's plan for His people. He writes the law on his, their hearts now as the righteous commands that we begin to believe that what God has said is holy, it's good. You see, the wicked despise God's truths. The wicked stand against what is holy and good. And that's what Romans 1 teaches us. It says, furthermore, though, just as though they did not think it worthwhile to have the knowledge of God, God gives them over to depraved minds so that they do what ought not to be done. They're filled with wickedness, evil, <coughs> greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, disobedient to parents, no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death. That's God saying the, this. That should make all of our hearts tremble. This is what a portion of living in the fear of the Lord is about. We should be, wait a minute, uh, I have still do some of those things. I need to turn. I need to turn away. I need to turn from my self-righteous ways, my understanding, my weaknesses, calling on the power of God to supersede my weakness to walk through these things. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve that they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of others that practice them. Now this is our culture. Everyone reads the news, no one gets a newspaper anymore. So when you looked at the news, were you just dumbfounded again about how depraved this world, one more step every day, every week, it's just mind-boggling of how depraved our culture has gone, how far one more step away from righteousness, how deceived this world is becoming self-righteousness on display. And God calls you and I out of these self-righteous thinking to be reconformed, to be shaped into the image of His Son. Right? Romans 8, 28. The great purpose of your life, why you walk this spinning dirt ball, is to be like Jesus Christ. He is completely holy and He is completely without sin. His life is the model life of all Christians. And the believers in Jesus Christ love that picture. Full of peace, full of mercy, full of joy, full of goodness. Everything our soul is longing for. And he's calling us when he says, follow me. Follow me. This is the picture of what God's doing when he gives us his new heart. This new heart is affected by the grace of God. 
He writes his law on our heart and on our mind to walk in his way, to walk in his will, to love his statutes, to keep our lives in line with what God says is righteous. Loving his law, loving his commands. Paul walks through so many, just in the book of Romans, he talks about the righteousness of God. Chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Because of your stubborn and unrepented hearts, you're storing up wrath against yourself in the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God's going to repay each person according to what they have done. So if you persist, for those who persist in seeking good, doing good, honoring God, living morally, He will give eternal life. This is the obedience that comes from faith. But for those who are self-seeking, self-righteous, who reject truth, who follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for everyone who does evil. You see, this is not some little add-up to our lives. This is really the center of what it means to walk with Christ. And when we hear that gospel truth Romans 3 and verse 20 says, Therefore, no one's declared righteous in God's sight by your works. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's when we talk about the law. That's why, well, no, we're, we're believers in Jesus now. We don't talk about the law. No, 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 no. We love the law. We love it because it tells us what we ought not to do. Imagine if you were to have a bunch of children in a, in a playground and there's all sorts of things going on with no rules, with, with, no, with no fences, with no barriers. What would we do? We'd run out into the street. We'd be trying to feed the bears, whatever would be going on. Now, we need the law of God. We need these containments. We need these understandings because that's who we are. We just do what we want. We think everything we do is great. That's part of our problem. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The entire Old Testament is, is talking about the righteousness of God being found in the God-man himself, the Lord Jesus. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Be very clear, that is the root of the gospel. Absolutely, the, the, the center of it, Romans 3. There is no difference between Jews or Gentiles, for all have sinned. That's the problem. That's the malady of mankind. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, who's rich in mercy, they are all justified freely by His grace. His, un your, his unmerited favor to open your mind, your conscience, your heart, wherever, however you want to describe it, God meets us in all those places. He's convicting of sin. He's encouraging you in what is righteous. That's the Spirit's work from John 16, the three-fold picture of what the Spirit's work is. Convict you of sin so that you would walk in repentance, turning away constantly from what's evil, knowing what it is, believing it is, and then commending you for what you do what's righteous. And encouraging you to live in such a way that heaven is your hope. Heaven is what you're looking forward to. Not your vacation. Not a new car. Not your stuff. That Jesus Christ alone is enough to satisfy your soul. That's the great hope of mankind. That this life full of misery, heartache, trouble, and pain will one day end. And for those who have heard this glorious good news, enter the joy of your master. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. 
Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace. So ju justified freely by His grace. So the text in Romans 4, you see, Abraham believed God. And this is what you and I are commanded to do. That's what faith is. Believing God and then putting it in action is faith. The picture, Abraham is a hundred years old. His wife is 90 years old. We would all say, ah, oh, science, no way, no way can Sarah have a baby. Are you kidding me? It's nonsense. Not Abraham. Not Abraham. Abraham believed God. That's faith. That's what God is telling us to be like. To, to come to Him like little children. To believe that what He said is true. And He is all-powerful to do what He says will be done. Abraham believed God. Sarah had a son. Would we believe? God, I hope so. I pray, Lord, that we would be believers in you, in your word, your truth, in your revealed understanding to mankind because our pragmatic scientific world, no way I can't do that. Well, the fact is, God, we live by faith. It's a beautiful faith. It's a big understanding of God. So, that faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Your faith, your belief that God raised his son from the dead and he lived a sinner's life first and foremost. Can you imagine that for a minute? Just think about it for a second. He never sinned. The Lord Jesus never, ever sinned. No lust, no greed, no coveting, no complaining, Never a complaint. As he's standing in the garden, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Oh Lord, give us this heart to be like your son. You see, Abraham's faith was credited as righteousness. And when we look at this text, righteousness and justified. By God are synonyms. They are the same word, the same meaning, the same understanding. So hear the word of God. But also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, belief in God, and what he said will happen is true. For us who believe in him, who, was ra who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, this is the gospel, descended from David, raised from the dead, Paul would say, this is my gospel, Sin's life. For us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, He was delivered to death for our sins. Personally, He was delivered to death for my sin so that this sick sinner could make it to heaven. And for each individual that turned to God in repentance, He saves those souls. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and He was raised to life for our justification. You know, we don't do a lot of Greek study. It's no need, but there is a peculiarity with that word in the Greek. This particular word, justification, that's used, is also used, same word, in 518. And when we word the word justification, it's, it, it's, it's righteous, it means that, but this particular, it's an adverbish kind of thing. Greek parses different, so I can't really say it like that. But this is, this picture, this word is to actually live righteous. To live righteous. Not that you are just, not that you are declared righteous before God, hallelujah, that upon my death I will stand righteous before God. That's, that's, that's the mercy of God offered in the gospel. Absolutely. However, this particular word, Translation, this particular, this, these two places is the idea that we are to live righteously. We are to live 
out this gospel good news. We are to live and understand in such a way that this is glorious good news. That others, you know, if you read Psalm 1, it talks about how, and if you know the, 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 the parable of the sower, right? A farmer goes out to sow a seed and he sows a seed, right? And that, that picture is about people preaching the word. The word's going out. And some of it falls and gets choked out here, and some of it gets scorched up there because the world is just, is this, you know, our, our, our enemy is strong. He, he, he stomps on it. He, you know, does a lot of the shade and, and all these pictures of how the enemy functions in this world. But however, the seed that was planted in good soil, the good soil is, it, is the fact that we're lay open to God's judgment. And that seed was planted, and that God causes it to grow. But how does it grow? It grows, it's just a little stalk, right? It's, it's, it's a, a storm can blow it down. But Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one whose, whose, whose roots are in the living water, are, are by the stream. That, that plant then grows up. As Isaiah would talk about someday, to be a mighty oak, fruit that bears in season. That fruit is for others to feast on. That fruit is, 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 is for this world. It's not for you. Those, that, that plant that's grown up gets woody and strong. Because the gospel truth is now alive in their soul. So that the storms of life can't blow it down. The phone call. The diagnosis. These things can now be dealt with in the truth of the gospel. Because we have been declared righteous. We are justified by God in the good news. So therefore, since we have been justified through faith, declared righteous through faith, we have peace with God. What, what does that mean? Well, think about it in the inverse. That means you didn't have peace with God. You, you lay open to His judgment. You lay open to His wrath. And that's what Paul talks about later in the chapter. This world, as it mocks its way through its drunken stupor and its nonsense and its lying, cheating ways, does not understand there's a judgment coming upon this universe. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about how there is going to be, uh, when Jesus comes back, we are just going to be dumbfounded and standing in His right hand. He's going to burn the entire universe down. true. But our lives now are being filled with the love of God. Because all of us want these great relationships. We want peace and mercy and love abounding between each other. So therefore, what's the conclusion? What's the therefore? There, This is a picture of what it is. What's a picture of what it's going to look like? Since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace. That's how it was given to you. You didn't do anything for it. It was just God's gracious hand. He gave you a gift, and you received that gift. So now Paul says, look, here's the deal. We're going to boast. You're going to boast in God now. You're going you're to you're live in a way that your boasting is not in your stuff. I've lived in this town for 30 years. I got, I watched a neighbor down the street. I just watched his, he, he had a big garage, Lamborghinis, the whole thing. I just watched him get driven out of his garage a couple weeks ago. An old man without hope. Very sad to see. Very sad. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith in His grace in which we now stand. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. That's how we ought to do things, and that's the righteous way to live. It's the righteous way to do things. If the Christians would go to work believing that, as Colossians chapter 3 commands us, don't work for your earthly masters, but work at everything as working for the Lord. Christians would make an impact on this world. You'd have business leaders going, whoa, 
I would meet a bunch of those dudes. They show up on time. They don't complain. They do their job. They want to do better at it. We would change the world. We would begin if we if this truth became alive in our lives, in all directions, in our marriages, in our homes, in our in our workplace. This world would notice. It would stand up and be like, "What is going on with those people? What's happening? They're different." They're not loving this world. They can't be baited into the folly that we are in. Because huh? we have a hope. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also, hmm, the life of Jesus Christ. We glory in our sufferings. There's no one here who doesn't have a suffering in their life. Everyone's got a suffering. Everyone's got a trial. Everybody's got a trial and a difficulty they're going through. This is, this is a veil of tears that we're walking through. Okay? And if this is all that it's about, damn this world. If there's no God, this is nonsense. But there is a glorious and gracious God because nothing comes out of nothing every time. We know there's a creation, so there is a creator. We know that we glory in our sufferings and our difficulties because this suffering, these trials that God has allowed in your life, are designed to shape you in the image of Jesus Christ. He's allowing every single one of them by His permissive will. Every one of them. You say, John, that's hard. You don't know what I've been through. I, I get it. I get it. But trust me on this. The Word of God is clear. God has in store for you glory in a way that you can't... You, you're, the glory of God that He has in store for His children is beyond your imagination. It's so far beyond your imagination. You, you don't even see dimly as in a mirror right now. You, you see so little and understand so little of what God is going to do. But this is our hope. This is where faith is credited as righteousness. If you read the Revelation, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Meditate upon what God, the picture, what picture God is talking about, particularly in Revelation 19. You remember Jesus at the Last Supper. I will not drink this cup again with you until I drink it anew with you in heaven. That fourth cup of wine, Jesus Christ Himself is going to pour that cup and He's going to put it in your hand. And you're going to toast the Lamb of God at that wedding supper of the Lamb of the Lamb. And you are going to stand in awe of His power, of His glory on full display. That's what God has in hope. That's what He has in store for us. So the sufferings, the difficulties, the trials of your life, God is saying, look, boast that boast in me in them that I'm walking through with you. Oh, you're not alone. Oh, no, no, no. I walk every step with you. Take, take comfort that God is allowing these things to shape you into the image of His Son. He goes, the Lord Jesus goes to a cross. And you don't think you'll have trouble. His only Son, whom He loved, goes to a cross, sinless. And we don't think we're going to have trials. Oh, yeah. We're going to have difficulties. We're going to have trials. But the Lord walks with us every single step. He's near to the brokenhearted. He's near to the humble of heart. For God opposes the proud, the sin of the devil. He, pride is a wicked sin, but He gives grace to the humble. If we will humbly walk with our King, He'll walk every step, every single detail of be with us. So we glory in our sufferings because they're there. They're not going away. They didn't change. Let's, you know, death happens. They're not coming back to life. It's life. Walk with the King. Because we know that that suffering is producing perseverance. This moving forward despite the pain. Because Jesus has put it on me. Bring it to the cross and leave, those, leave that baggage right there at the foot of the cross. I can, I can discharge it. I can bear those burdens. Bring it to me. Bring it to me, the Lord says. This perseverance, this, this walking in a way that the world's going, how are they doing this? And our answer is by the power of the Spirit. 
and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. This perseverance then is producing the true character and nature of who you really are. You see, what happens is in our self-righteousness, for me as an example, business John, you know, pilot John, all the different things, they're all little masks. We, 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 we paint ourselves because we want the world to think of us a certain way. Oh, he does this, and look at, he can't push this. Meaningless in the kingdom nonsense. And the Lord comes with his paint scraper. That's not who you are. You're my son. This is who you really are. You walk through the trials of this life with your head held up high. When I walk with you, that's who you are. Character. Perseverance producing character. Who you really are. Who God truly meant you to be. And that character, when the Lord's doing it, is confirming heaven in your soul. That's the hope. The only hope of mankind. There's no hope outside the risen Lord Jesus Christ who defeated death. There's no hope. Consider it for just a second. What other hope can there be? Except for the resurrection from the dead, our final enemy defeated on that cross. When Jesus walked out of that grave three days after he was put in it. Final enemy was destroyed so that we can walk in hope. And that hope does not put us to shame. Like we're somehow sort of like, uh, like the world mocks us for that. Ha! Huh, these guys didn't believe it. Oh, you know, something dead can't come alive. That's right. Unless you believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless he raises those from the dead. He raises everybody from the dead. Be very clear on that. It's another picture too. We've got to really wrap our hearts around. That's why we love the lost. That's why we go and preach the gospel. We don't want them being goats on his left hand. The lions destroy goats. There's a hope. That's credited as righteousness when we believe it by faith. That's what this is about. This is the only hope for mankind. I spent plenty of time in the world studying philosophy and trying to figure out if there's another hope. I looked everywhere. Couldn't find one. Couldn't find people that were killed for what they say they saw. Couldn't find any other hope offered to mankind other than a risen Savior. I couldn't find an answer to my moral problem. I couldn't deal with the, the pain that I caused myself. No. Turn to Christ. Turn to Christ in a greater way today. And this is for believers too. Look, the life of Christ is a repentant life. Your heart is thousands of little slices that make you. You're a, you're a mom, you're a sister, you're a cousin, you're a, you're a friend, you're a, a co-worker. You're all of these things in life. Each one needs to be held up in the light of God. And allow God to change your heart on the subject. Let Him, when you come into repentance, change my heart, O oh God, on the subject, that I would be more like you. Because this hope does not put us to shame that we have this hope of heaven, this hope of resurrected life, this hope of eternal, of this church in some way being presented before God in heaven is holy, spotless, and clean, righteous before God. Hope that we have does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love this undeserved, unmerited favor of God has been absolutely deluged. The, the, the love of God that's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Not a little straw, just, just like kind of filling you up. We're talking as if you're standing at the edge of an ocean and a tsunami wave as high as you can see is going to deluge you. That's the love of God in the believer because he sent his son. He killed and crushed his son for your sin. How much more can he do for us? It's, a, it's such a mammoth amount because God so loved the world. He, he sent his son 
to die for sinners. He gave him, he gave us his son, whom he loved. You guys have heard me say this before. I love you. I wouldn't give my son for you. God did. Holy Spirit has been given to us to know this love of God. It's his job. It's what he shows us. It's what he's encouraging us in. It's what he's guiding us for, to, and through. So the righteousness of God displayed on the cross for sinners. To be embraced to the obedience that comes from faith. The vertical righteousness that God offers is an alien righteousness. You can't stand before God without the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to you, imputed to your account. When that righteousness came by the power of the Spirit, He now commands us to live horizontally righteous before others, before this world. As Jesus was told, He commanded, He won a good name before God and man. Righteous, imputed, Horizontal righteous, our words, our deeds, our actions. Father in heaven, we can talk all day about your righteousness. We can glory and be so thankful to the mercies offered from heaven above. Lord, where would we be without this hope that you've given us? What would we do? Lord, we would be reveling in our lusts. We would be lost and without hope in this world. Well, Lord, because of your great love for us, Lord, you did what we couldn't do for ourselves, and we're so thankful for it. Lord, thank you, Lord, that uh, your word is open on this pulpit each and every Sunday, Lord, without shame. Lord, I thank you that there's a body of believers here, Lord, that love your truth. Lord, and I pray that this truth that's come, Lord, would be an encouragement to everyone who hears it. You would gain the glory through your name. We praise you. In Jesus' name.